Today, I'm here to talk about, you know, building an ML experimentation platform for easy reproducibility. And if since you're all here and you are, you know, experienced in the ML op side of things, you know how important, you know, reproducibility of ML experiments is and what are the challenges that are involved. And we're going to, you know, see some of them and also address how some of these ML ops challenges, especially around reproducibility, can be solved by using LakeFS and how can you go about building an experimentation platform after this. And I'm Veena and I currently work as a developer advocate for LakeFS. And as you can see here, I started as a software engineer and then eventually moved on to the data and ML side of things. Worked at, a, you know, worked at Nike, Apple and other companies before I landed at LakeFS where I'm currently now working as a developer advocate. And as I as it shows, I'm an open source contributor and I like to, you know, I like to talk about the data engineering and the MLOps best practices, the things that I've learned and the things that I'm still learning about because it's never really ending, as you all probably know better. And yeah, so let's jump right in. Enough about me. This is something that we've all seen, especially in the MLOps space, right? Because literally when you are talking about training an ML model at scale or whatever scale it may be, the ML code or the actual training job is literally the probably 5% of the whole, you know, avenue of things that one has to do. Like starting with data collection, when you have different data sources, each of them, you know, sending in data with different schemas and whatnot. And then most of the ML ops problems are not necessarily machine learning problems, they are data problems. So that is why there are parallels being drawn between data engineering and ML ops, because if you solve the data engineering problems, you're almost always solving relative ML ops engineering problems too. And of course, as you can see here, it, it, it is not just about the ML code, there is like a bunch of data problems around that needs to work. And to kind of dive deep into and look at the, the flow of what an ML experimentation or just an ML ops world looks like. Of course, it starts with multiple data sources where we get our you know, raw data from. And then you go about curate, curating the data depending on whatever your use case may be or whatever your ML model you're building for. And then feature stores, of course, because now it's not always you know, advisable to go back to raw training data every time because we have like different ML use cases and sometimes all of us are working with the same training data, which means that it's good to have these uh, reusable features that multiple teams and multiple ML models can use instead of just duplicating it every time. So we went one step further to use a feature store. And the next one is of course feature retrieval in terms of depending, again, depending on if you're, if you're working on a recommendation system or a search engine, the feature retrieval might differ. And also, even if it is not a recommendation or a search engine model that you're building, feature selection methods are something that we always play around with and you need to have that mechanism as well and validating the features and eventually comes the model training part of it and then validating the model and tuning the hyperparameters and whatnot and eventually serve the model and keep it in a registry as well so we can come back at a later point in time to see you know, how the history of models were so like what were the history of models that were served at different point in time. Now, all of this looks very linear, but then if there is one thing that we know how MLOps is different from software engineering, it is that software engineering and the software development is very linear, whereas MLOps is not. We move back and forth all the time, starting from data cleaning and data pre-processing. We try out different data pre-processing methods, different feature selection methods, and even like you know, handcraft different features, and then again, use different ML models to train and eventually see if this is all making sense. And if not, you always come back and play around with different variables, including hyperparameters. So it is always to and fro and back and forth. Because of this incremental and iterative nature of, you know, ML development, although this one looks very linear, there are like steps that are, you know, interchangeable and they do go back and forth. And to accommodate this different nature of ML is why we need an experimentation platform that will enable us to do this. So you can deliver ML development at a higher velocity as we are doing with software development. Now, these are not by any means the exhaustive list of challenges in ML Ops, but these are some of the challenges that I have experienced and people who I speak with experience on a regular basis. Like ML, the, having an ML experimentation infrastructure, like we just talked about, 
just to make sure we can develop at the same velocity as the software engineering world without you know hindering us like the availability of tools and the availability of infrastructure should not hinder us from making progress when it comes to ml development and the second is of course like you know the crisis of reproducibility i'm not sure if it applies to all of these industries but most of these people most of the people that i spoke to from pharma and fintech for example they have very strict regulations on when they can use specific models for example if somebody is using an ml model or ai to actually diagnose cancer now you want to make sure that ml model is reliable and trustworthy right so the way that you can actually reproduce a specific model after a training you should be able to do that at any point in time if there is an audit from nfta for example you should be able to do that at any point in time so crisis of reproducibility is more pronounced in certain industries and not so much probably in ad and you know other serving industries but that's one of the biggest challenges of you know having a solid ml experimentation platform and explainability of course and i think explainability and trustworthiness of ml models kind of go hand in hand and thanks to neural networks and you know for the development of models like we've kind of lost them to black box setup and so even though it is you know still black box models the ability to still arrive at the same set of models irrespective of how many ever number of iterations of trainings you go through is still important again that is one of the challenges that is still not resolved as well and another interesting thing that i have also experienced in my past is that you know having this ownership around data and feature so if there is a different team that is responsible for you know or who who owns that specific training data and you use that data to go around build some features and models and at some point in time you few think oh you know what i want to go back and create new set of features and see how my model is going to look but by the time you go back to create these new features that training data that you use is not going to be there you know it probably got updated and you know aggregated you don't know because the uh, ownership of the data is in the other team and now suddenly you will not be able to create new features on the same set of data and the minute you lose the same set of data you have nothing to compare the models against they are not like you know apples to apples comparison anymore and it's not again possible to go back to that specific iteration of the model and i guess it's the lineage problem is again like not very specific to ml i think it's like data lineage in general is a big problem when we try to go back to who changed this data where is this data coming from and going back all the way to the raw source of data and collaboration i think of all these problems collaboration is probably like the least tricky of the solutions here uh, of the challenges here because you know working in teams i think we to some extent mastered it but one challenge though is because it is ml training set and if it is uh, it is not as big we're not working with petabytes of data to train an ml model at best we're talking about a few terabytes of data so because of this nature somehow we were okay to copy the data across multiple buckets and across multiple teams and collaboration is not happening the way it ha it is happening in software engineering we don't use git for example or for the data side of things or like the data versioning for collaboration in general is not as prevalent and the other problem is of course version controlling all of these ml assets you know together atomically and this is a very interesting thing because we do have lot of tools today in the ml ops space that can version you know data and the code and the models and the assets for us but somehow we don't have one tool that can version all of these together for us most of these tools leave out the data component and version everything else and we have experiment tracking and model monitoring and everything else but again the minute you start going back to the original training data on which you created the features and training the models it would all like you know start breaking apart because there is no one way of actually versioning all of these components together now again as we saw we have plenty of tools despite you know all the challenges that we still have despite all these tools we still have all these challenges right it's like look at this we have so many end to end tools and data centric tools that will that at least promise us that it can do versioning of all these components but still today we are here talking about those challenges all over again which means i guess those solutions are very fragmented and we don't have an end to end infrastructure for ml experimentation and now just you know getting started with 
one issue, the first, the top most and the prioritized one is the ML experimentation side of things. And I, these points are almost covered here. I've done like, you know, like we've talked about the iterative nature of development, how it is, you know, to and fro. And again, ensuring data consistency in terms of when I run a model training today, and if I run a model training tomorrow on the same set of data and the parameters, will I even have access to the same set of data and parameters and the configs to be able to arrive at the same model? Do we even have the consistency to do that? And only if you have that consistency will you be able to trust your ML pipeline, right? So it's all very interlinked to each other. And again, like compliance to regulations, because in certain industries, the regulations are very constraining and you need a way to do this very effectively as well. And again, reproducibility and explainability. It's like all these challenges when I talk about it, like we all understand these challenges and we've all come across these challenges. Some of us even worked with these challenges in the past or even currently. Let's just, you know, move on from here and see what actually can be done from this. Like we understand these challenges, what now? Now, here is where Lake FS comes in. Remember how we talked about this whole process of starting from raw data all the way to serving your model and monitoring it? You can use LakeFS. If you use LakeFS for your experimentation platform, you will be able to version everything, including the data, you know, the features and the model and the metrics, including the artifacts of it, together at one place which would be your LakeFS repository. And just to give you an idea of how would it look, here, for example, as you can see, LakeFS offers Git-like branching. So when you are experimenting with Git-like branches, for example, you can imagine having your training data sit in your main branch, or say that is your production branch, for example. And for every iteration of your ML experiment that you're running, you simply want to branch out and then run your experiments in that specific branch. So you can go ahead and create as many you know, branches as you want, as many experiments as you want to run. Now at the end of it though, you can vary all these parameters and in each of these branches, you will have all these components, right? The code, data, raw data, pre-processed data, features, and like, you know, model artifacts, metrics, configs, everything in each of these branches by themselves. And at the end of it, you can even compare these models for their performance and say, hey, whichever model is a winning model, for example, based on F1 score, I would want to merge only that branch to production, which means I'm going to push only that, I'm going to deploy only that model to production, you know, to serve my customers internally. And just by having this, you know, Git-like branching for your experimentation platform, you will be able to achieve almost, you know, an end-to-end -end data versioning capability for your MLOps. Now, like, how can you do that and how, where does even LakeFS sit with your existing set of tools? As you can see here, LakeFS essentially gives you Git for data, right? It sits on top of these object stores or any of these data lakes. Be, you know, if you're with AWS, then I would start with AWS S3 or GCS or Azure Blob, or even if it is an on-prem uh, object store like MinIO, for example, LakeFS sits on top of any of these object stores and it offers Git-like interface. What it means is that if, suppose if you have your training data sitting in an S3 bucket, all you need to do is, you know, have LakeFS create a repository on that S3 bucket. This is just like a Git repository now. Now you can go ahead and create a new branch out of this repository and work with the data in this new branch without actually affecting your production data or the actual you know, training data that is living in production. Now, in this new branch that you created, you can you know, commit the data at different instances, for example, in every step of the ML training, right? When we curated the data, when we created new features, or when we were training the models, when we were storing these artifacts, you can take commits at each of these steps, and at the end of it, you can either choose to merge it or just delete the experiment if it didn't you know, turn out to be as fruitful as you thought it would. Now, the existing host of applications that you currently use to train your ML models, you know, be it TensorFlow, Spark, and SageMaker, and Keras, and whatnot, all of these packages can access LakeFS the same way it accesses S3. So if you already are using uh, any application that is using the data in S3 to do the ML training, it would work as is on LakeFS as well. So with minimal intervention in your existing code, you will be able to do this. And the one on the right side is just, you know, a very visual representation of that. 
as you can see, if your S3, you know, the training data is in a specific S3 path, the new, the only new change would be just, you know, adding the name of the branch to that existing path. And that would be it for you to actually go ahead and train the model. Now, when I say that you can just create a new branch every time, is it like copying the data again? Then if it is copying the data, what is the point, right? This was the problem we set out to solve. This can be explained because LakeFS does not necessarily copy the data when you create a new branch out of, you know, a main branch, for example. What it does is it only copies the pointers to these objects underneath. So all of these object references are being copied when you create a new branch. So branch creation operation is only a few milliseconds. So even if you do have like, you know, terabytes and few petabytes or even few hundred petabytes of data, you would still be able to, you know, create a new branch for an isolated experiment environment in a few milliseconds. So there is no delay in that as well. And currently to, you know, give you an idea of the scale of things, we have a couple of customers like Toyota and Volvo and Lockheed Martin who are using about 100, no, 10 to 12 petabytes of data uh, without any, you know, scale restrictions at all. And because of this, and you can also see that, you know, suppose if the, the data has changed, suppose if you deleted a particular column and say, hey, I don't want this column and I don't want this feature to be used in my ML model. And when, the next time you do a commit, it is going to, you know, update its object reference. Again, if you go about creating more features, because we tend to create, you know, additional features from the existing training data, it is going to create new object references to the added data. But the common data the common objects would have like, you know, shared object references and only the new data would get, you know, written back, meaning LakeFS does copy on write anytime a new data is getting added to it. Now, I guess enough about LakeFS. Let's go ahead and see how it can actually do the experimentation side of things, right? Like we just talked about, you can have all of your training data live in your main branch. And in the experiment branch, for example, you simply branch out and start running your ML experiment. And you can have tags at different points of these experiments to say, you know, when was this trained or add any other metadata that you want to be able to reproduce it or to be able to reference it later, essentially. And it can include, you know, hyperparameters, training URL and infra URL and whatnot. Or some of, in some of these cases, you may even want to add the model artifacts because they can also be like read later. And unlocking collaboration was the second one. And just to give you a very high level overview of, you know, how one can use LakeFS for unlocking collaboration is similar to Git, like I said again. And you can have different people work on the same, you know, ML training data by simply branching out. Another interesting thing that I may want to add here is that LakeFS also has role-based access control, which means you can choose, you know, which teams or which team members would have access to what kind of branches or what, you know, specific prefixes of data that you already have. So this way you are making sure there is data governance in place and you're not exposing your data to all of the organization as well. And in addition, it also supports branch protection rules, just like in Git. So for example, if you say, I don't want any parquet files in my prod, or I don't want anybody to merge data into you know, production branch directly, you would be able to configure that as well. And now to the most important part, how one can go ahead and version control all of these ML assets, right? Which is, again, by branching, you will be able to do all of this. But then the most important thing is how it can also include the training data, not just the models and the metrics that every other tool also does. And as um, in the demo that I will show, I would talk about how you can actually version all of these together, including, you know, the raw data, pre-processed data, features and everything together. And yeah, this is pretty much about, you know, what LakeFS can do for the ML experimentation. And if you are interested, like, again, LakeFS is like an infrastructure that would give you this uh, features that you can build on top of based on what your requirements may be for an ML experimentation platform. And now, when you are using LakeFS, there are like different kind of use cases one can think about. Like, for example, if you want to experiment in isolation, which we just talked about, it's like create a branch and you're good to go. And if you want to create a tag, this is specifically around reproducibility. So you can create any tags, like, you know, how we create release tags in Git for different, you know, versions. 
these tags would help you go back to a specific iteration. So you could just check out that tag and you have everything ready for you. And reproduce, of course, like refer to that specific tag and you're able to reproduce and reprocess and undo a change. Like just like it, you will be able to do the merge and re you know, revert as well. Now, let's quickly dive into the demo. And in the demo, I have an ML experiment running. I have used the wide quality data set. And what I'm trying to do is like a simple experimentation, which is like in experiment one branch, I'm going to try a couple of features and then use a different you know, classifying model. And then in experiment two, I, again, I will create a different set of features and I will use a different algorithm. And then in the end, I'll compare the performance of both of these, both of these models. And whichever is the winning model, I'll just you know, push it into production, meaning I will merge it into the main branch. And in the end, I'll also show you how to create a tag and reproduce a specific iteration of the experiment as well. So let's dive in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is how a LakeFS uh, URI looks. And another thing that I want to mention is that LakeFS has, you know, a URL. It also has a LakeCTL command line utility if you're, you know, uh, the CLI person. And it also has different API clients. If you're a Python, Spark, Scala, Java user, you know, depending on whoever, whichever language you're comfortable with, you can play around with that as well. And this is how the, the UI looks. Okay, so I'm just trying to create a new LakeFS repository and to create a repository, I would need a bucket underneath as well where my data is residing. And I am not, I've not used S3 here. I'm just using MinIO because, you know, any S3 compatible object store LakeFS can work with. And I'm just creating a new uh, MinIO bucket in here. Mm -hmm. So it currently has, you know, no data, it's all empty. And now let's go ahead and create a new repository over that S the S3 bucket or the MinIO bucket we just created. As you can see, no uncommitted changes. There is only main branch, no tags at the moment. So now I have configured a Jupyter notebook because I'm a Python user, so I'm going to use Python API client to you know, run my ML experimentation and also to you know, talk to the LakeFS underneath. Just a bunch of you know, installations and dependencies and import statements. And then I'm configuring it with you know, access and the secret keys and whatnot. And now we've already seen how to create a LakeFS repository and a MinIO bucket. So we are good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here I'm going to treat the main branch as my production branch. So I'm not going to put everything and anything into main. And ingest data is the landing zone where I get my, you know, my ML training data or the raw data from these different sources. And so I have currently two branches. And as you can see, the you know commit hashes for both of these branches are the same. What I mean by that is because we created, uh, because these two branches share the same set of pointers, of course, these commit hashes are the same. And let's go ahead and upload the wine quality data set into our ingest branch, Sim you know, trying to simulate how our data sources will push the data into our landing zone. Cool, so we have the today's date partition, CSV file, and in the uncommitted changes, we can see, you know, what, what are the files that got added as well. Just a quick overview of you know how to see the number of files that got changed. And once I commit it, of course, you can see it in the commit that what are the files that got updated in this specific commit. And yeah, so this is just a you know a little bit of data exploration that we all do just to understand what the data looks like and what are these, you know, what are each of these columns and features like. Mm-hmm. And another interesting thing is that uh, LakeFS UI also has DuckDB embedded. It comes with it. So if you are using Pandas and if the scale is not as much, you don't even need to get started with Spark, for example. You could just like use DuckDB to query and like, you know, do the data exploration side of things and Pandas to run your, you know, uh, data cleaning, pre-processing and SKLearn or whatever tool that you would use to actually train the models. Mm 
Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. So we're waiting for the plot to be done. I'm just trying to look at, you know, what are the feature correlations look like. So I'll know what to do with each of these features. Am I going to delete some of them or what, what will I do with these? And just like quick outlook of, you know, like how our data labels look like. It seems like, you know, it might be a highly imbalanced class problem because clearly we don't have enough data points for all of the classes for the quality of wine. And just a couple of utility functions. Okay, so here is where my experiment actually starts, right? And for experiment one, I have like, you know, certain configs that I want to run, meaning I want a standard scalar and PCA is just a template example just to show you, you know, for the purpose of the demo. And these are the configs that I'm gonna use. And now I will create a new branch named experiment one. And let's go ahead and see that. Okay, again, you can see that ingest data and experiment one have similar point names, meaning I just created from them. And it only currently has the raw data. Let's just save, like, you know, dump our configs, the current configs that we have for this experiment. And okay, so we dumped the configs. This is how it looks. Cool. And the next is, let's go ahead and create some features out of these data columns that we have. And I'm, I looked at the, you know, pair plot of each of these features and I somehow think, you know, because of the pair plot, some, some of these features are correlated. For example, acidity and pH because they are all almost similar and correlated. So I, I went ahead with the PCA just to see, you know, if do I need all of them or I'll just pick a top I guess six here because I'm okay with the 90% variance explained. And okay, so let's just go ahead. So this is how my features look like. Now I have like six of these components. Mm -hmm. So now I've written my features as well. And as you can see here, this is how they look. And now let's go ahead and train the models, you know, to start with. Like before that, of course, I wanted to split them into the test and the train set and then write them back as well, because I want to have the same test and the training data to be able to reproduce my experiment later. And so, of course, so when I run the experiment, I get about 64% as my F1 score. Mm-hmm. Of course, I'm not happy with it, but I would anyway go ahead and save my model artifacts and the metrics. Mm -hmm. Great. So we had done like, you know, running experiment one, we did like a almost, you know, five, six steps of, you know, how to run that experiment and we committed at each of these steps, we have everything captured. And for experiment two, yeah, okay, so before we go into experiment two, another important thing that I wanted to show is about the lineage of things. For example, now when you see, oops, oh my God, no. I really hope so. Okay, not bad. All right, so what I wanted to say was here basically, when you do, you know, look at the, the final commit, you will have the option to go back to your parent commits, right? So you, you have a commit log of each of the commits that you've done. And the commit logs are also accessible to you programmatically, you know, from the API. So you would have like, depending on, you know, how, however long the process is, like all the experiment that you're running, you will be able to access all the way back to the raw data. Meaning now you have the model and you know what data and what features created the model and then what are the configs associated with the model and 
all the way back to the raw data and the data sources. And here I'm showing it in the UI, you know, for the effects of it, but you are able to access this, you know, programmatically as well, and you can play with it as you need. So yeah, we went all the way back to when the repository was created. And then again, experiment two is kind of similar. I think I would quickly run through this just with a different set of configs and parameters just to make sure it is different from experiment one and hoping for a better results, of course. So another thing here I'm trying to do is, you know, playing around with the labels instead of having like, you know, one to 10 labels, I'm just trying to group them into good, bad and okay. Hoping it would help me with the imbalance problem, but it won't because again, it was normal distribution and both of the ends would be, you know, the long tails. But I'm just playing around with the labels to see if it will help again with my FN score. Okay, again, so I guess we do get a better F1 score compared to before, but now I'm just gonna, like, you know, save this model artifact and the metrics, of course, and I'm not gonna try to forward it this time. Mm hmm. Okay, so I do see that it is, you know, better here and I go to my branches and I will now try to compare the branches, you know, like let's compare the experiment one branch and the experiment two branch, of course, for the... And see, of course, you know, the metrics and how they look. And you will be able to see the difference. And in the end, so I decide, of course, the experiment two is better because it gave me better F1 score. Now let me go ahead and merge. I want to merge experiment two into main. So yeah, let's do that. I'm selecting the source wins because the source is my experiment two branch and I want to overwrite it into my main. And that is it. So if you go and look the commit history of main, of course, it is going to have all the commits from the experiment two branch, which is now, you know, added to your main, like deployed from experiment two branch to your production. Now, so another part of the demo is like, you know, how do you actually reproduce a specific experiment using LakeFS tags? So for that, I'm just gonna, you know, define a tag with your, you know, with today's timestamp and go ahead and check out the data and all of these models and the artifacts from that specific tag. And as you can see here, when I try to check out it, the features look like PCA you know, zero to six, which is what I had in my experiment one. And as you can just go ahead with it, all I'm trying to show here is if I check out the same set of models and same set of data and try to, you know, use the model on the data, if I get the same accuracy, I'm not going to train it again. I'm just going to, like I, you know, show here, just, you know, op open the job lib file from our model uh, artifacts prefix and then see if it gives us the same metrics and it does, which was about 64%, which we got it from experiment one. Mm -hmm. And if I check it with experiment one, it is the same, of course. And experiment two, of course, had a different number. Cool. 
So just by creating the tags, which is similar to Git tags, you're able to check out a specific iteration or a specific commit, you know, however old the commit may be, and reproduce the same iteration of the experiment. And that's about it. That's all I had for the demo. And lastly, I wanted to like, you know, make a shout out to the LakeFS community. LakeFS is an open source project. So if you have you know, if you are, first of all, interested in contributing to the project, you're always welcome. And we have a thriving community of users and contributors from these different companies who are currently using LakeFS as well for, you know, different use cases. And again, since it is an open source project, if you think there is a need for, you know, one of your teams or companies that you would want to check it out, feel free to give it a spin and then see how it goes. And if you have any questions or, you know, anything at all about the use case, feel free to connect with me, of course. And there is also a Slack community where we discuss about, you know, the challenges and the use cases and whatnot. So there is that as well. Thank you so much for being a wonderful and also patient audience when the video kind of got, you know, messed up. But that's great. Thanks, everyone. Whoa.